And we're on. We're on. We're back. We, we're back for a second episode. Incredible. <laughs> We've been watching with Claire Woodward and David Stevenson. Amazing. Yes, that, that difficult second episode, David. <laughs> it is. Should we stop now while we can? Yeah, well, we're on top. Why not? How's your viewing week been then, Claire? Um, it's been quite interesting, actually. Um, I It was great to see um, John Sim back on the telly, on Grace on ITV, the adaptation of the Peter James novel, crime novels, um, because he looked he looked older. And that was a shock to me because this is a guy that's been in loads of, you know, he's, he's a bit of a Britpop kind of actor, isn't he? And to see him take that older role as a, as a maverick cop was, uh, was really interesting. I know it was good, wasn't it? Because I, well, I always associate John Sim with Life on Mars and, and, and that amazing title sequence in Life on Mars where he goes and jumps off the roof. And I mean, I think that's what a lot of people feel anyway at the moment. So <laughs> it took me ages to get that out of my head, really. But I love John Sim because he's quite a sort of understated actor, isn't he? He doesn't really, mm -hmm. he doesn't really do a lot, but he can be quite intense as well. I mean, if you wanted to cast an incredible thug, you know, who didn't look like one, you'd cast John Sim, wouldn't you? Mm. You know, I can imagine, you know, he should have been in train spotting or something like that. Well, absolutely, because he's of that generation of actors. But I mean, and I think it was really clever to cast him in this because I would never see him as as um, as a policeman who goes to see a psychic, you know, who does a bit of dousing over a map. Um, you know, normally in his past roles, he'd be going, oh, hey, we're not, we're not having that. Um, but in this, he's really believable. And as you say, understated. And um, it's another one from our favourite Russell Lewis, isn't it? Yes, well done, Russell Lewis. We love him for Endeavour, Morse. Yes. Everything, think, really. Everything, really. And if you, if you go and watch um, Grace again about 10 minutes into the programme, you'll see on Grace's uh, whiteboard of old cases, you'll see this cute little schoolboy picture of, of a boy in a, a, a grey jumper. I think that might be Russell Lewis as a boy. Well, really, I thought, oh. what you were gonna, I thought what you were going to say was Colin Dexter, you know. <laughs> Yes, they brought Colin Dexter back from the dead just to appear. Well, funnily enough, I watched the first episode of Endeavour this week as well. And, you know, it was great to see Colin pop up in that. But uh, um, our Russell is turning into a bit of a Hitchcock because he, um, he's quite mysterious. There's no current pictures of him. The last one I could find online was when he was um, played Young Winston in the film Young Winston. Oh, right. Interesting. Well, we must get him on the podcast. We will have some guests one day when we get going a little bit. I mean, because I've yes, noticed all, all our audience now, I can see there's some in America and there's someone in Greece who is listening. So uh, there's a big... Is, do we have a shout out on podcast? We can have a shout out to my friend Maria in Greece. Hello, Maria. Gosh, I've never seen any Greek television. I think we should review a Greek TV show. We'll find one during the week. That's a great idea, actually. Well, there's the thing on London Live called My Greek Odyssey. I mean, London Live, which is the channel which presumably just signs up really cheap programmes because it's got very little else to offer. But, and it's, uh, but it's also, um, London Live is great to look at because it's in standard definition. So if you want to go back to what viewing was like 20 years ago before high definition, you sort of tune into London Live, don't you? I mean, you get you get you get to see programs as they were made in the time they were made as well. <laughs> That's really interesting because I mean I've only had my new TV for about three years. I had a cathode ray tube telly until that, so it's going to bring back those cathode ray memories, big style. Um, the other thing about Grace is I I found it difficult to pick the culprit. I didn't pick the killer at all. I mean, obviously the the stag do that went right or wrong depending on your view. But I suppose if most of the people who are on the stag do die, it went wrong. <laughs> Narrows um, it down a bit, doesn't it? Yeah, but uh, but I I didn't pick I didn't pick her, the female serial killer who was attracted to property developers. I thought that was quite interesting. It's an interesting <laughs> way to make a living, isn't it? Yes, it was. I mean, oh, attracted to property developers, that's quite specific. But um, no, you're right. And I do know a few people talking on Twitter and saying, you know, they really hated the storyline of the guy being sort of buried alive in a coffin. Uh, and they said they switched off. And I thought, oh, that's quite, you know, I've, I've seen a lot worse on television. Um, I, I don't know why they, people seemed a bit squeamish about it. But 
you know, he didn't die in the end, spoiler alert. Um, I just thought it was, it was, um, it was visceral, but it was it was just very interesting. And I really look forward to some future episodes of that and just see how Grace's character develops. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it seemed, he seemed to have a nice supporting cast, a la Unforgotten. He had a sort of caring side as well to him, didn't he? I mean, he wasn't. Mm. And, and he had that classic thing, of course, he didn't have a partner. She has mysteriously disappeared. I wonder if that's going to develop over the series or not. That was an interesting side to him. But at least he wasn't too depressed. I mean, the classic trope of the detective yeah. suffering from every single mental illness imaginable didn't really come into play. <laughs> Although he was sort of borderline DCI Banks, I thought. Do you remember DCI Banks? Who I think he listened to too much jazz, don't you? I mean, that was what he... yeah, definitely. Nobody wants too much jazz, so it's just a, it's just a terrible thing in general, isn't it? Too much jazz. Oh, terrible. So what are we going to give? We, we'll give it a rating. I think uh, I think it's probably four and a half for me I think but just because I, I agree I conquer yes definitely four and a half from me as well because and it and it just it just seemed the right about of time as well you know it made two out it filled two hours which sometimes those things don't do they yeah we like two hour films so more please Russell Lewis that's our conclusion there yeah as ever And on the other side, as they say, on BBC One was the conclusion of Bloodlands, which, um, I mean, I found this series quite incredible in every respect, particularly the whole thing of running around going, I am Goliath. No, you are Goliath. I am Goliath. I am Goliath. I mean, I mean, it's, 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 the, it's the biggest catchphrase of the year, as far as I'm concerned. Whether there was anything well, beyond it, I don't know in terms of, it, I mean, I was quite taken aback when they said they were coming back for a second series. I mean, James Nesbitt, I'll probably watch it. I would watch him reading the phone book, really. He's got a great range and he's a great actor. But um, in the end, he didn't really, it, it was sort of unbelievable. You had this detective who's see seeking out the truth, you know, trying every means possible to find the killer. But then he'd turn away and be a total psychopath, getting a gun out and starting to mow people down on a farm. I mean, it was, it was, it was too incredible to believe, I thought. Well, I mean, <laughs> and I, you'll be surprised to hear I didn't actually watch this because I just thought I cannot take another police drama at the moment. It, the, the world is full of police dramas. And um, I like James Nesbitt being happy as opposed to James Nesbitt looking all grey and sullen and sunken faced. But from what you're saying, you know, the police elements maybe don't ring true. I mean, I do have a friend who, who's a fairly senior person in the Northern Ireland Police Service. And I did meet him once when he had a gun in his pocket and I just said to him, have you got a gun in your pocket? And he said, uh, oh, you're just pleased to see me. And he said, no, I've got a gun in my pocket. So he was a bit more careful about carrying his guns. But it just struck me that, you know, it's a Jed Mercurio series. He produced it, didn't he? Yeah, no, absolutely. Or executive yeah, produced it. He didn't yeah, write he was, it. He was the showrunner, as it were. So, yeah, he was, yeah. he was reading it all along, I think. And there was... There was a Jed Mercurio touch to it, wasn't it? When at the end of the second episode, I think it was the second episode, was it? I mean, James Nesbitt's character, Brannock, just pulled out a gun and shot this guy. You know, and you thought, you're a policeman, you, you, can't, you can't just shoot people, apparently. But apparently <laughs> they did in this one. I just thought it was did too you? bonkers. I mean, I really, I mean, you know, and you're absolutely right about firearms, but that's one of the attractions I thought of it for the people who were making it because. You can then have an American style cop who's got a gun in a holster and will take it out at any point and shoot oh. someone. And I, you know, I, I know that's a very cynical outlook on it, but I do think we love dramas with a lot of firearms action in it. And, you know, a lot of duty will speak about that in time, but that mm. has got, you know, it's, it's full of sequences about firearms officers. And that's where the excitement, if you like that sort of drama begins. So, they were trying to borrow a bit of that. So I'd be amazed to see what happens in the second series. I mean, I'm, I, I, you know, go on, surprise me. <laughs> well, I mean, did you think it was a bit um, line of duty light, maybe? It was a bit. It was like the entree. It was the warm up act for the for, for line of duty. I mean, I don't think it was planned that they would run uh, concurrent. No, not current, concurrently, back to back. But mm, that's, mm. How it's, that's how it's turned out. I mean, it's great for Jed. I mean, he's, you know, if you're going to put a drama in anyone's hands, put it in his. But 
his sort of hallmarks, because we know his work so well, become a little bit too obvious to us. And I mean, you, you want a bit of subtlety to this. You don't, I mean, when James Nesbitt, when Brannick turns up at the farm, you know he's going to kill this woman and then see, he's going to kill the other guy as well. I mean, he just does. And then, <laughs> and then he's off. And then it probably the, the police, the cavalry turns up and goes, oh, yeah, we believe your story completely. Um, but you're wow. right. There's quite a bit of crime drama around at the moment. And we've got another seven weeks coming up. We'll talk about, we'll talk, we'll talk about next week towards the end of the podcast. Towards the end. But maybe Jed should get back to writing something comedy like the Grimleys again, which I actually forgot that he'd written. Um, well, yeah. I think it might do him good, maybe. Yeah, and I mean, he does, he writes irony well. I mean, with things like cardiac arrest were actually mm. quite funny, but I'm quite sick, but I would sort of laugh at a hospital drama where others wouldn't, but um, <laughs> casualty, <laughs> casualty is a comedy, isn't it? It is, and we won't talk about the comedy idea we had, will we, David, because it's very, very tasteless. Yes, that's very tasteless and very sick. Let's move on. <laughs> Well, one of the happiest shows of the week, definitely, was Alan Carr's Great Interior Design Masters. Was it great? I think it was it called that? No, or Interior Design Masters. I mean... Interior Design Masters. Yes, masters. Exactly. I mean, it's the last show I expected Alan Carr to be associated with. In fact, he was on the other channel that night as well, wasn't he? In DNA Journey. I don't know whether he called that. I didn't... Absolutely catch everywhere. But don't you think, though, I mean, I think maybe one of the reasons he was cast is because Joe Lysett has been an absolute genius on um, the sewing bee. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're taking comedians or comedic presenters and putting them into what are essentially reality formats I'm not, I'm not talking down reality formats some of them are quite engaging but um this one i found you know quite a bit of fun i, I got into it i've got into it over over the weeks and i think the final is on next week and shock i'll be vaguely interested in who wins it <laughs> you're interested in soft furnishings david this is fantastic but oh, if again, i go into a manchester department i'm lost <laughs> <laughs> but so you no know, car is you know he's a very engaging guy and i think it's nice to see comedians do something not not more serious than stand up but just something a little more engaging because i was thinking this week about the caroline flack program on on channel four and what was so interesting about Caroline was she was 40 and um, she was at that age for a, a female presenter where, you know, can you carry on presenting Love Island or do you have to move on? Whereas it, it, and it's difficult for women like that to move on in presenting because they're light and fluffy, but there's always another younger person coming along. So I certainly got the impression she had a very difficult relationship with, with her job. Yeah, absolutely. I um, listened in on a, a webinar with uh, Caroline's mother and sister and the makers of that show, and it was absolutely fascinating, but it was equally depressing as well, because a lot about how she was, and I'm sure this was in the, the film itself, uh, addicted to her phone and couldn't put her phone down, literally mm, couldn't mm. put it down, which must have been absolutely awful. And she also, although she sought help, would go to a succession of different doctors because she didn't want anybody to find out uh, how she felt but she thought it would stop her getting work that must have been a genuine fear that she had mm -hmm. well you know bearing in mind you know we were talking about harry and megan last week you know mental health is very much the byword um i suppose it is difficult if you're seen as having mental health issues because you know you've got things like insurance coming into play um, but she was a very much loved woman. Um, but as I say, to me, it did point out, you know, wh where does your career go from here as a TV host? Whereas at least all the comedians we're seeing all the on all these competitive making shows, they have careers anyway, and they're, and they're used because they're smart enough to deal with live work. They write their own material. So, you know, these comics are clever people, and that's yes. why they're in demand. Um, you, all I can say is I, I know um, Channel 4 have got a making jewellery show coming up and I, I don't think that's presented by a comedian. Well, it's interesting. Did you get into the pottery show? I couldn't. I lasted five minutes on the pottery, the great pottery throwdown. Good, good title. Sort of shame about the result, really. There's something a bit, well, too, there's something a bit too slow about pottery. I know it's probably 
I mean, you don't sit there looking into a kiln for an hour. <laughs> That'd be a nice BBC Four slow television show, wouldn't it? Well, exactly. I mean, and it's okay if it's Grayson Perry making pots as well. Or, you know, what I really miss is um, um, middle-aged women on um, uh, making pots on the Generation Cave. Uh, really badly made pots with stuff flying everywhere, but I never got into Throwdown either. And I, was, it was a Sunday night thing, was it? It was a Sunday night, a Sunday yeah, and I, eight o'clock. I, I don't. I think it's too relaxed for Sunday night. I mean, the whole the whole thing about pottery is it relaxes you, doesn't it? I mean, you don't want. Mm. But we say that we've got things like the repair shop that relaxes me far too much. I, you know, mm. the lovely stories in it, and it's beautifully done as a TV show, but I find it just a bit too steady. Yes, it is. You know, you do need a jolt occasionally, don't we? You know, maybe maybe if someone brings a, I don't know, a, a sex toy in that needs repairing, <laughs> fair shop or something like that. Uh, this uh, is my mother's uh, dildo. Yes. <laughs> I mean, so next week the final of Interior Design Masters, and I mean, I think I'm, uh, I think Siobhan is in it, the one who has a different coloured wig each week. I'm, I'm backing her she, just for sheer creativity. She seems like a, a force of nature to me. Yeah, and she seems like a very nice uh, lady, you know, she works, I think, in the health service, but I didn't like her dark ceiling this week in the cafeteria, it kind of spoiled the ambience for me, but, um, and, but, you know, there's, there's some proper characters in that, and it, it is, it is, I think, some way it seems gentler than the sewing bee, I, I don't know why. Um, yeah, I, I think, think they take I, a bit I more I think take the sewing time. bee judges are quite waspish, you know, Esme and Patrick, they're a brilliant double act and yeah. they just add to the sewing bee, whereas I think, you know, um, interior design has to be carried more by the contestants and, and Alan Carr. Yeah, interesting. He's great when he comes into the room, though. He's just so funny with the contestants. I, I loved it when he was sort of propping up against that bit of plywood saying, oh, it's so <laughs> strong and everything, you know, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. So we get, I mean, I'm giving five stars to that. I think that's the best new reality show this year. There probably aren't that many to judge with it, but um, there will be as we go on in the year though. Yes, obviously. I mean, I'd give it four because I think the sewing bee is uh, just got that little, that little edge on it, but it's what we need at the moment, isn't it? It's nice, nice warm and cozy television. Absolutely. Television to cozy up to. Right, we're sailing along like a cruise liner full of holes, aren't we, really? <laughs> or, or like the uh, Great Canal Journey on Channel 4, or is it, what's it called now? I know it's got new It is presenters. called Great Canal Journeys. Um, uh, thing is, it's, I think it's had a demotion now. It's gone from Channel 4 onto More 4. Unless oh. I don't know my fours from my moors, but I mean, I, I, I only found it on More 4. And, or is that a promotion? I don't understand which is upmarket a promotion or a demotion. That's, that's a very good point. Maybe people from Channel 4 would like to let us know what the difference is between More 4 and Channel 4. Um, yes, that's 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 a very good I think, thought. I think it's slightly more upmarket, isn't it? The, which would drive away most of the audience. <laughs> but Channel 4 like to think of themselves as being incredibly upmarket anyway, don't they? The mm. channel. A bit like BBC Two used to be, I guess. Yeah, that's interesting because I mean, I think uh, what I, again, I'd like Channel 4 to tell me why are they always repeating Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares? It's on all the time, constantly. I'm surprised the tape hasn't worn out. The show is at least 10 years old. You know, some of the restaurants in it have probably long closed. Some of the people featured in it are, are, are actually dead. I, I've looked this up. Choked so, on their own cooking. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, there was a terrible man that ran a thing called Burger Kitchen. Uh, he was Australian, strangely enough, David. Uh, <laughs> he was a son of a son of a son of an Australian thug. But I'd really love to know: have they not got anything else to show? But um, I mean, if it Canal Journeys, maybe it suffered because it hasn't got um, Timothy West and, and and his wife Prue on it anymore. Well, they were, um, they are, they I, are I the couple, and I think it was a shame they had to, to give it up, particularly. Um, Timothy West, who was just such an enthusiast and knew so much about it. Is it, is it a brilliant on TV when you do get somebody sort of unexpectedly knows a lot about a subject and they want to tell you everything about it? I mean, then you're completely taken in, aren't you? Yes, it's so Rather lovely, some, isn't it? When they want to share that information with you. Yeah. Rather than some dilettante who knows 
absolutely nothing, which you get all <laughs> the time on television, claiming to be an expert. Let's not get into experts, though. Yeah, but I, really, I really enjoyed this episode the, through Staffordshire, which we don't see a lot in travel logs. I wouldn't I wouldn't say underrepresented in travel logs. They can put that mm, on the side of the to Staffordshire. And the new presenters are um, Sheila Hancock and Giles Brandreth. Um, and I think it's really nice to see people on it who are friends. Um, uh, you know, as opposed to, oh, let's find a cute older couple to do it. You know, these people are friends. And, you know, there was a certain amount of, um, you know, personal information in this as well. I mean, Sheila Hancock got um, uh, Giles to confess that everything he was doing, he, he, you know, he said, I have to be happy all the time and I have to be on all the time. And he said, the reason I'm doing this is to please my father, who's been dead for many years. I thought that was very moving. And um, Sheila Hancock talked about her late husband, John Thor's collection of Clarice Cliff, where um, when they went to the Clarice Cliff, um, Clarice Cliff's old home. So, you know, there was there was personal stuff in there and it was it was just very sweet. And, you know, I've never seen Giles Brandreth, you know, so revelatory. It was it was very, very enjoyable. The countryside looks great, too, as well. It is it's beautiful and green, isn't it? It is a mm. green and pleasant <laughs> land. Shocked to see, but it was incredibly green. It was almost a sort of lime green, wasn't it? I don't know. I don't know is that is that the rain? Lime is green. that acid rain? Is it is it being coloured in? Possibly, yeah. The potteries. But uh, no, I loved it. I loved Giles when he was talking. It was probably in the same conversation about how he almost of his own will makes himself jolly because Sheila was talking about how you're just you know the jolliest person in the room mm. but he was suggesting that you can make you know an existential way I can make myself jolly you know which I mean not everyone has I think the capability of doing that but he but he I think he's still naturally very funny very witty but I'm the jolliest person in the room seems to be his motto and it, it makes for great television though even if we're at all not capable of being incredibly <laughs> jolly for every minute of our lives Maybe she'd do a mental health program, how to be jolly or something like that. That's my pitch to Channel 4 for this week, to replace <laughs> Gordon Ramsay's kitchen nightmares, how to be jolly with Giles Brandreth. I've got it. I've got it. It did come to me as to why we have so much Gordon Ramsay, because I think Channel 4 likes swearing, I think, you know. Okay. I think they well, love shows in which I would say if you did a survey as to how many swears there are on the main five channels, I think Channel 4 would be just stratospheric, to be frank. I mean, OK, we all like a little bit of swearing, but they really go for it. And, and Gordon Ramsay provides that instantly. You don't even need to say, can I have a little bit more swearing in this half hour, please, Gordon? <laughs> all bleeped out, though, of course, for daytime uh, viewers' sensitive ears. Yeah. But yes. Hmm. Yes, that, that's the, anyway. We will go canal <laughs> journeys. We 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 do like a lot, don't we? And we, we yes, we like that. Shows, definitely five stars all round for great canal journeys. Yeah, four from me because I'm fussy. Right, it's time for the classic of the week. <laughs> In fact, you don't need to look that hard to find a classic of the week, do you? Because Faulty Towers, this week's choice, was on primetime BBC One. And in fact, I tweeted something. I thought, does anyone know anything about this new comedy on BBC One called Faulty Towers? <laughs> and a wag got well, back to me that, um, that John Cleese will be delighted because that's his residuals sorted out. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yes, there's uh, this is uh, his interesting ex-wife's uh, rent paid for the next six weeks, but it really stands up, doesn't it? How old is it now? Is it 1977? But it really stands up, and it still made me laugh like a drain, even after all these years. I know, Lord Melbury. I mean, all the all the, isn't it interesting about the class stuff? You would think, oh God, we don't think about class. Class hasn't got any real relevance to us anymore. But you watch that and you realise, my God, all the jokes still work just as well now as they did then. All the Melbury stuff, you know, O'Reilly, the builder rings in, you know, the Irish builder. It's a stereotype, but, you know, people instantly know where you are, what you're talking about. So I found that side. And then, of course, you've got um, Manuel there as well. I mean, I thought that, that even that didn't seem too dated to me. In fact, through a sort of Brexit prism it seemed quite interesting as well the way he was being treated by faulty 
which is, you know, a classic comedy thing, isn't it? You know, there's almost sort of theatre of cruelty there, you know. Mm, mm. Uh, yes, it's interesting what you say. It is utterly timeless. I mean, you know, even the fact that Basil and Sybil wear classic clothes, um, it, it's only the hotel that's really brown and dated. But anything else, you know, it, it is still so fresh and human. So do you think if you went to Torquay, you could find a hotel like that with a major sitting in the I, breakfast room? God, wouldn't that I, be wouldn't that be brilliant? It'd make yeah, if they haven't been done over by the hotel inspector or something like that. But I love the uh, family in the um, in the bar that couldn't get a drink in this first episode. You know, a large whiskey and orange squash. You know, it, 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 there's lines from Faulty Towers that just pop into your head occasionally, isn't there? You know, like. Um, all right, Sybil, give my regards to the Earth's core. <laughs> the facetious to make me laugh, laugh, laugh. But, you know, let, let, lest we forget, you know, this was written by John Cleese and Connie Booth. Yeah, and people forget that Connie's input, I think, I, I, I think it probably made it, brought it down a bit from his point of view and made it a bit more human. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good point to make because um, I think they concentrate, I remember, listen to Cleese talk about concentrate a lot on the plotting I think she had a lot to do with that as well and I think that's there are great lines in it but it's the fact there's such a tightly woven plot in it this had a plot of a um basically a fraudster didn't it really yeah and yeah I mean one of the one of the more interesting appearances is it was was Robin Ellis as the detective Poldark, original Poldark turns up in five Poldark, yes. Wonders of classic television now to see someone. You know, we're sitting there for five minutes saying, God, I'm going, God, I recognise that guy. What's he, who is that? Who is that? You know, because he looked nothing like he did in Poldark. He's had much, <laughs> there was much more hair. I mean, he obviously was before Poldark. And then suddenly, my God, it's Robin Ellis. <laughs> Yeah, it didn't really have um, that. Oh, I think Bernard Cribbins appeared in it. He was a big name. Nicky Henson. Um, I can't think of any other you know, massive household names that appeared in Faulty Towers, you know, because it was a real, you know, it was a real character driven piece. Yeah. And it was, was it that it was always cancelled after the first series i think it was wasn't it and they, i mean bbc it due to lack of ratings i guess yeah i mean it is interesting that we i i you know i don't even know how comedy comedies develop now to be honest i think they don't develop someone just bungs them on as quickly as possible just to see if they mm. take a bit and if they get going but um i mean this they worked on the scripts i know uh quite lengthily for this um but it was just as you say timeless and we shall revisit, and hopefully the German episode won't be too uh, badly edited. I don't know, are they, are they going to censor and not mention the word German or something? That'd be interesting. Oh, I mean, how can they do that? I mean, it, it, oh, it's just so ridiculous, isn't it? But I mean, you know, it's funny that we're watching Faulty Towers now, which is now BBC Two, now on BBC One. And I was looking at the ITV Hub the other day, which only has eight comedies on it. God, that is depressing. Are they, so um, that's eight. They've probably only made, ITV's probably only made eight comedies, though. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, and they are things like um, Man About the House, George and Mildred, Plebs, um, which is the Roman sitcom. But honestly, eight sitcoms, what does that say about the state of sitcom? Mind you, George and Mildred, Man About the House, I could, they could have an evening with those two sitcoms, I oh, think, just about. George and Mildred is still hilarious, I have to say, but um, I'd quite like to see something contemporary. But, I mean, what was that um, uh, sitcom that ITV did, set in the cafe with Brenda Blethyn? Oh, yeah, that that's a, only recent. The last couple. That's, yeah. that's been recommissioned, actually. I mean, I think Oh, that's Brenda, good. Yeah, she's. I mean, she's great at comedy, Brenda. Um, but I think people love her more for Vera, so I just, I'm not saying stick to Vera, but Vera is a fantastic Stick show. to Vera. Oh, yeah, they yeah, devote the time to Vera. No, but it, um, that was, yeah, I remember giving that the rocket, actually, that cafe thing. I just needed more characters. I mean, it just mm. depends. It's, you do, I suppose that sort of comedy is built on who's coming through the door. You know, you can't just have the postman turning <laughs> up, can you? Oh, God, no, well, hello, it's the postman. You know, but things like um, I noticed on Brickbox this week, um, Big Train has gone oh, up, yes. and I still think that I didn't watch it the first time around, and now I still think it's one of the most underrated sort of broken sketch comedies 
there's ever been. It's it's fantastic. Well, it's great now, isn't it? Because these streaming opportunities through um, Britbox, iPlayer, and the like can bring back all these classics now, just in the way Spotify allows your children to find out who ELO are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And every child, David, as we know, should know who ELO are. Absolutely. But, um, so do we give a do we give a rating to a classic? I mean, I I, I mean, I remember I was stopped once uh, at immigration coming into Australia, and I said, "Oh, you know, what what do you do?" I said, "Of a TV editor," and he said, "Oh, what's your favourite show?" And I said, "Faulty Towers." And he, I don't think he'd actually heard of it, so I went into <laughs> lengthy explanation. And I think that's the only reason I got back into the country briefly. But anyway, yeah, there well, you are. We love, we love it anyway, and we, we, we just can't it. get enough of it. Oh, I know, I know. And now the important part, podcast mm. listeners, um, the show everybody's been waiting for this year, apparently, which was stopped in the middle by COVID, like everything. Line of Duty is back. Are, are you excited, Claire? Are you despairing? I, you I am excited it? because I only started watching... The, the new one is Series 6 yeah. or 7, is it? I only started watching Line of Duty in Series 5, so obviously I started watching it in the middle and I kind of had no idea of what was going on. So I went back during lockdown, watched it from the start. I think it helps, doesn't it? But I think the nation is is genuinely thrilled at it coming back and uh, if we find out, if we don't find out who h is i will kill jen curio frankly <laughs> that's an interesting spin-off <laughs> yeah yeah so that's a promise jed you heard it here first but what can you tell us david you've seen the first episode what can you tell us well there are two new characters there's a kelly mcdonald character and there's a new character in ac12 and they're both obviously they're both central to the two plots that that run in it i mean all i would say about it there is there is there is one there is one sequence one good sequence to it um i can't say much about that either um they avert they, they stop an armed robbery at one point i think i can say that and that's all very mm. exciting and the guns are out as i'm saying i mean it's the more guns in this than the guns are never owned to be frank <laughs> um but kelly mcdonald is fantastic she heads up um, this murder unit and of course you know you're immediately looking at the character going god well is she dodgy how dodgy is she what's, <laughs> what's going on and there's a couple of surprises along all the way for her character but um i think it's a great performance by her i mean i haven't i'm trying to think of when i've seen her on the tv like probably uh, boardwalk empire mm, where, mm. Where the wife i mean she actually at the launch she talked about um, how she'd never watched Line of Duty because she'd done so much of Boardwalk Empire. I mean, so she'd not she'd not caught up with a lot of British culture. I mean, I <laughs> no one's ever called Line of Duty British culture before, so there you go. But um, yeah, plot-wise, that's about all I can say. Um, and there are interesting things happening with Martin Constant's character as well. That's that's developed. Um, Adrian Dunbar's fantastic as ever. You're just waiting for him to appear. I mean, he's sort of fantastic lilting accent you're just drawn into it he's really funny i love i love ted so i mean they're all there it feels a little bit like um it's quite a steady episode in a sense i can i can you know the tension is building a little bit slower than some other premiere episodes of series but it's uh, five stars all the way i mean i think just the theme tune gets people excited now if you please wouldn't play the theme tune anywhere I don't know, it'd probably break up a riot, I imagine. People would look around and say, where's the screen? I want to watch the Well, we can have parties, Dave. We could all be dancing to a theme tune from Line of Duty. It would be brilliant. But presumably, this is not go This is going out week by week. It's not going out as a box set. No, and I think that's interesting. I mean, I think, um, I think people would love to binge it, frankly. People would just go right through it, wouldn't they? And I think when the show first went on Netflix, I think it did a lot to make it, a worldwide hit didn't it because people mm. were doing that and it stands up to that i mean there is a what's great about this series is we've got a bonus episode so there are seven episodes so in a sense what i'm saying about the first episode which feels a little bit more procedural and not as sort of heavily dramatic as a, a, as it sometimes can be um i think he's stretched not stretched it but he's certainly got as much out of the plot um as he can and the other thing he revealed at the launch was that he knows how the storyline of H will develop. He knows how that will conclude. 
So it'd be interesting if they say <laughs> we get to the end <laughs> of this series and there's no, there's, H has not been resolved and he doesn't get oh. the series. So, um, I mean, of course, that won't happen. I mean, please tell no. me that might happen, DVC. I'm sure that I'm sure there will be another series because he, he's so brilliant at, at eking out this fantastic storyline. Um, I think he has to give us something, though. I mean, you know, th this is the thing we want to find out who H is. And while the journey is amazing, um, uh, there, there comes a point and it's just like just just tell us just tell us but it, it's great that it's bringing back event television isn't it you know stuff that you can't binge and stuff that you know it's a shame there's no water cooler anymore because hardly anybody's going into the office so it's not water cooler television it's social media television everybody will be discussing it on social media weren't they tweeting yeah. as they go along yeah absolutely a pr i talked to today about um, you know, how many how many rate how much the ratings would be how big the ratings would be for it said it's one of these what they call destination shows so mm. you know, people decide what they want to watch on tv now by these destination shows so they go looking for these shows or they hear about it see it online and then go to these shows rather than looking at a schedule so you know they're expect we were speculating as to whether it'd get a bigger audience than oprah with megan and harry i mean of course nothing will be as important as oprah with megan and harry but oh hang on <laughs> The first episode of Line of Duty will be more important, uh, in my view. But um, oh my God, David! Do you know who's H? It's Prince Harry. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. That's it. That's why he's gone to America. No, you don't need to watch Line of Duty anymore. We've discovered who H is. Prince H. <laughs> <laughs> now it all falls into place, etc. Yes. And there are two other things worth worthy of mention next week. I've um, I've seen a new documentary, uh, the first episode of a new documentary series about Churchill's, the first episode is called Churchill Beginnings. And it's interesting, it's by an award-winning um, director whose um, name escapes me, but he's just picked up an Emmy. And the idea is to tell Churchill's story in the whole. So there are six episodes, and I think it does touch on the controversies about Churchill and his character, um, allegations of uh, racism, um and nationalism uh, and you can make up your own mind so having come away from the first episode i thought it was thought provoking and really interesting and i don't think i've seen a, a long-running documentary on churchill so but no you're right about the churchill thing because i've never seen a full-length documentary and with everyone talking about you know churchill is still very much with us isn't he like kenneth williams is in a more political sense um when people can make their own minds up that's fantastic what, yeah, what channel is that on that's channel five and it starts on friday that's well worth a watch um another one worth mentioning is a documentary i haven't seen yet a one-off documentary about kate garraway and her husband derek and i imagine that will be probably as harrowing as it is interesting about his plight which of course is tragic but um you know all credit to her for letting the cameras in i think they started filming you know right towards the beginning of his his illness so um that's yes on, i mean that's on tuesday night on itv he's he's quite remarkable isn't he you know he's, he's one of the longest patients they've that's had covid isn't he and you know i like derek very much you know he was um uh, you know he was a he was a therapist and i saw him as a patient and i just think he's absolutely wonderful and i just think it's very brave of kate to do this i mean i don't know how she keeps going frankly um oh, i think it's amazing that she's able to keep going on gmb and to do stories about covid mm. while at the same time having a tragedy play out in her own family it's remarkable and you're right bravery is the absolute word for it and there's only one other thing which is on tonight which i can't say tonight because i don't know what day we're going up <laughs> it's ridiculous let's start, it's let's, on. It's just let's on. start again um it's all star musicals now i haven't watched this but um one of the one of the contributors to it is robert peston who does a number from guys and dolls luck be a lady tonight and i was thinking god you can't go around singing luck be a lady tonight now you'd be arrested wouldn't you <laughs> Well, I've seen the photos of this, and I mean, would you ever think that Robert Peston would have a yen to sing a song from Guys and Dolls in public? Uh, well, he said, he was, 
said he was looking for some escapism and I think he's probably found it and he should go back into his bottle actually. No, he wants to still be taken seriously, which if you're a political pundit and interviewer is probably a good trait to have. So um, I recommend that one as well. And uh, apart from Line of Duty, which would be the thing everybody would be talking about, that's a little bit of froth as well. Yes, well, we can reconvene next week and talk about Line of Duty for quite a long time then, can't we? Is it the usual length episode, an hour? It is, yeah, it oh, is, yeah. So. An hour, that, that should satisfy everybody then for another week until they can find a water cooler or maybe just, maybe at the end of the episode, everybody will go out of their front door and we'll have a clap to Jed Mercurio. <laughs> Brilliant idea, David. Let's do that. Let's have the nation clapping for Jed Mercurio. Right. See you outside, everybody, on Sunday yeah. night. And thank you Bye. for listening. Bye. Till next week. <laughs>